Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome everybody online. Um, it is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Jonathan Daniels. He's a graduate of our Houston campus and, and as part of my chapel series sort of this spring, I want speakers who were successful in their careers um, before they came to seminary and switched over into the ministry. So Jonathan was actually a functioning engineer here in town in Houston. And before, uh, then he came to seminary and he's now a youth pastor at Shine Bible Fellowship. And his passions are training young people, adults and teenagers uh, into the ministry. And so Jonathan, if you would come up and share. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I remember being in your, exactly in your seats, right, with the, just at this library, it was um, not too long ago where I was listening to chapel speakers thinking that would be really cool, but they would probably never let me do it. And then look what happened. So I don't know if I snuck in and then Stan was like, yeah, you can come on up. And, but I'm, I'm grateful to be here and be in front of you all today. Uh, Stan did mention, I, um, so I just graduated from uh, DTS, uh, just this last semester, so I'm out in the real world, but it's kind of interesting because I was already kind of out in the real world. I had graduated as a mechanical engineer and I'd been working as an engineer for nearly 10 years. And then I, uh, well, about four way into that, I decided to go to seminary. I was um, working or volunteering at a church and I felt God, this call that we all have described multiple times and um, I've heard in classes. So I went into seminary with no plan. Right. Every part of my life up to this point had a plan. It was like go to, you know, really elementary school, middle school, high school. I always had a very strategic what's going to go next. And I went to seminary. I was like, what are you going to do with this? I don't know. And somehow God just works it out. And so that's about a little bit of encouragement to you all today where you may find yourself here and you're like, I know exactly what I'm going to do and praise God for that. Or you may say to yourself, I have no idea what I'm doing here, but I'm really enjoying it. And praise God for that. He will use it and for, for his glory and for your good. Amen. All right, so uh, right before I, um, when I was telling you the story about me coming in and doing a message, I remember thinking I know exactly what I wanted to share with them. So this is new, and so I want you guys to be my feedback for me. So if this is something I can repeat out to other individuals and go out into the world with this message, but I think this is something that um, I wanted to hear when I was in your shoes or in, into your seat. So I'm hoping that it will be encouragement for you all today. So before we get started, uh, we're going to be in Ephesians, so if you have your Bible, you can go there. Um, but before we move on into the text and hear from the word, word of the Lord today, let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for bringing us here today, knowing that everyone has a walk of life and they've come into this room with that walk, um, knowing that you're with us. Um, we know that we're here on purpose. We ask that you give us a word from you. Um, help me to move out the way and us to hear something from you that will encourage us, whether it be in seminary, in our lives, in our families, uh, so that we can move forward with the strength that only you can give. We love you. I love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I grew up in the Houston area, and I went to elementary school also in the Houston area, and every Friday there would be this event. So in our physical education class, our PE class, um, there would always be the best games on Friday. And so on Friday, what would happen is there was a room probably about, about this size, if you kind of use the atrium there, and the PE teacher would have this storage unit that would be in the back. And so they would go into the back, and we didn't know what it was. It was like this big mystery box of what was going to happen that day. He would go into the back, and he'd roll out with all the supplies that you would use for this PE class. And so we were really excited, and this day we were especially excited because we realized it was dodgeball. So he came out and he rolled out all the dodgeballs and everyone was excited. Was like, yes, dodgeball, we can play dodgeball today. And so he put all the dodgeballs in the middle. I hope you guys ever played dodgeball before. Um, so he put all the dodgeballs in the middle. He got lined up everybody, said, you know, count your names off one and two. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. All my twos get on this side and all my ones get on this side. And so we were all very excited, but there was always some characters in this dodgeball game that you have to make sure you knew about, okay? Number one character is those that are very aggressive, right? And those that are very, they didn't really go by the rules, but will try to cheat a little bit. And so this person, I'm going to name him, and I'm going to assume that if I don't have his last name, he's not going to list his message. His name is Russell. Russell was like the, um, the grizzly bear of fifth graders, okay? So super aggressive, always going after and, you know, people in a very aggressive way, more aggressive than it needs to be. And so Russell, you want it on your team. You didn't want to be against Russell. And so Russell would go off, and so he, he goes on a team. And then on the other side was my friend, my homie, my really good friend. Her name was Ann. Ann was like a bunny. 
okay, like a bunny. She was very, uh, you know, Dasa always did the right thing, didn't really want to do the wrong thing. The teachers didn't have to, teachers always had to worry about Russell. Russell was the type of kid, if you have a child and you go to a birthday party and this kid is wrestling around, you kind of hover right next to him. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to anything to happen to your child. And so you just hover around. But Anne was the, the perfect person, didn't do anything wrong. Now, Anne didn't really want to engage in dodgeball because that was kind of too barbarian for her. So she would just kind of stand in the corner, not really engage. So Russell was all in, right? So he's, game's going on, game goes. And so the game's going back and forth, people going out, out, out. And what Anne didn't realize was her strategy of actually going into the corner actually made her the best player. So as the game was going on, people are getting knocked out. Anne was the last person. And guess who was on the other side? Russell. So Russell, and then Anne didn't realize that she's just going off for a marriage. She's doing what she thought was the right thing. Just going, didn't want to engage in this dodgeball game. And then Russell sees her, realizes she's in the game, reels back and was about 10 times as strong as Anne, throws a dodgeball, dodgeball, hits her right in the face. It's her, the weight of it literally throws her onto the ground. She gets up. And this is what Russell does even, that's what makes Russell the type of kid that you don't want your kids to be around. He picks up another ball throws it again at Anne. Now she's crying. She just says, I give up. I'm tired of this. I give up. She's crying. She gives up. And she's saying, I'm doing all the right thing. I'm doing the things I'm supposed to be doing. And yet, she still gets hit in the face. Has there ever been us before? We feel like we're doing the right thing. We're doing what God wants us to do. And yet, we get hit in the face. And sometimes what that leads us to is allowing us to want to say, I give up. As you can tell, I'm probably going to get excited. So if I get excited, I can't help it. I try to calm myself down and I just tend to be more excited. But my question to you is, what then happens is what I'm seeing across the stage or across different entities and when it comes to pastors in particular is that individuals are just giving up. And you're seeing this out in our churches today where there are either moral failures that's causing them to give up or something about the faith that they've professed to for so long has prevented them from continuing on in that faith. And so what my message is for you is how do we prevent that? As ministers, pastors, future leaders in the church, how do we prevent ourselves from being hit so hard we just say, I give up? So our witness becomes something that someone doesn't want to use. Our God is a part of it. Obviously, he's going to get the glory that he's going to get, but making sure that we can continue to be a part of the side that is going to be used by God. So in Ephesians 6, Verse 10, it reads, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded up your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and with the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word of God. What I can tell you about you is that you've probably in a battle. And in any battle, there's always the battle prep. So you probably know all about the armor of God. You put on your breastplate of righteousness. You put on your belt of truth. You put on the shoes of the gospel of truth. You put on the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of spirit. You're in your Bible. You know exactly what the Bible says about each of these things. You understand what they mean and you put it on. This is what any battle happens when you've been able to put things on because you're doing the right thing. You're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to minister to the people of the gospel. You're trying to show them who Jesus Christ is, how that relates to their personal life. You're doing this right thing. You put on this armor of God, but the problem is the enemy steps in. And like Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan to get punched in the face. And the enemy steps in, and then the question is, is how are you going to handle the armor that you already have on? I remember for me, when the enemy steps in, he typically steps in in a place where it's already good for you and it's personal for you. Or if another way to say the enemy will attack your personal good to make you question God's goodness to prevent God's glory. I'm going to say that again. 
the enemy or the enemy's mafia, right, will attack your personal good to make a, you question God's goodness to prevent God's glory. I remember I was in my second semester here at seminary. I was doing all the things that you probably already do in yourself. And I remember I was so worried about starting this thing that was called a pastor or being in the ministry because of one thing. I didn't want it to affect my family because my family was, was very important to me. And I always heard, any preacher's kids in here? Any preacher's kids in here? Okay, I've heard some bad rap. I don't know. I'm not going to say much about it, but I've heard some, some things about preacher's kids that makes me not want that to happen to my own children, right? So I always would look at pastors that are doing well. Their children are tended to, you know, they've shown themselves to prove well and spend time with my family. I would always try to do these things because that was the thing that I never wanted to happen to be negative in my own life. So what happened is I remember this day was one of my biggest ministry moments I've ever had. But it's big because it aligned with my impact, because I may have said in my bio that I want people to be reconciled, be reconciled together that typically would not reconcile. And so I want to be in that space. And I remember I got invited to this church. It was going to speak in front of thousands of people. And these people weren't the type of people that would be like, oh, I get that. They're the type of people that if I talk about reconciliation between races, they'd walk out. And I was like, that's where I want to be. That's exactly where I want to be. Because that's where God is trying to lead me into these difficult places. And so I got invited out to this church. This is where I was going to go to talk about racial reconciliation. In the morning of, my wife, who was six months pregnant, had contractions. And as she's, we're sitting in the bed, she's having contractions. She's having signs that the baby is coming. So we rush to the hospital. We go to the hospital. Um, there's an 8 o'clock service, missed the 8 o'clock service. Go to the hospital, everything, check her out. And the doctor says, everything's fine. And I remember thinking while I was in the gospel, I'm like, this is the enemy. This is the enemy trying to prevent God's work from going out to God's world. So we go back and I remember I'm like, well, this is my fear, right? I'm not going to leave you. I'm never going to leave you because I never want this pastor thing to prevent me from my first ministry, which is my family. So, but I remember this like as yesterday, this is why I love my wife so much. She said to me, go. We're not going to allow God to prevent this from happening anymore. So I go. There's a 10 o'clock service. Went to the 10 o'clock service. I don't even know what happened. It was a big blur. I'd just been in an emergency room for multiple hours. So I went through it, did that. And I'm thinking, yes, finally, I'm doing the things that, like, in the season and out of season. I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm exactly doing the right thing. Then the second dodgeball hits. Two days later, same thing happens. This time we go to the doctor, and then our daughter, Gabrielle, was born. This is what doctors call pre-viable. So pre-viable is they can try to do as much as they want, but you have about a 2% chance that your baby's going to survive. So I sit there with my daughter in my arms, and she fights for about an hour. She passes away. You guys ever been there before? Where God, something happens where this armor that you put on seems to not have protected you in the way that you thought it would. And you say to yourself, and this is what we don't want to admit, you say to yourself, does this thing really work? Like this protection, this armor that I put on, does this really protect me from all these, the enemy, the mafia that's out there? What is wrong? Do you have a question? You have a thing you have to decide. This is what I have to decide. Do I really believe this stuff? You can either decide for your faith to fizzle out or your faith to fortify. And my prayer for each and every one of you today is that you would fortify your faith. That you would not allow the enemy to do exactly what he wants to do to prevent your witness, to prevent your ministry, prevent you from going forward. You would say, no, I'm going to fortify my faith. But the question, if I've led this well, as you're asking is, how do I do that? How do you do that? If you're going to do this well, this is the battle ready. I hope I'm doing good on time. Okay, I'm good. It's three steps. One, assess your armor. Remain righteous. Weaponize the word. Assess your armor, remain righteous, weaponize the word. With submarines are hit, 
a summary in here is the person that's in the front, they call it exception-based surveillance. It, like there's red and yellow going screens all over the place. And what that screen does is it shows you where there's weakening in the armor of this submarine. So that the people that are on the submarine can either go to that area and strengthen that area or realize that there's really nothing wrong and everything's fine. But the way they see is in that screen is what they need to do. And so what you need to do when you've been hit and you've been covered in God, you need to assess your armor. Because the, there's a few things I would do that will show you where your weakness lies. Maybe there's a part of your faith that needs to be fortified. A part of your faith that you didn't realize there was a weak place there and you need to go in and strengthen that part of where your faith is. I remember um, we went to the zoo and so I'm the dad. I'm like, so my, my wife is very regimented, right? She's like, she's very structured. If something says it's going to rain, it's going to rain. I'm like, maybe it'll rain. It's like 40 percent. Right, forty percent. It's like could rain, could not rain. I remember, so we were gonna go to the zoo, and I told him the day before. And uh, we live out in the northwest part of Houston, and I was going to the zoo, and so we're like, we're gonna go to the zoo. And my wife is like, ah, I think it's like a sixty percent chance of rain. I'm looking at the weather. And you know how you see the clouds roll over, and you're like, oh, good. It's like it rolls over, and then it goes away, and we're good. It's like sunshine and all day. So it's just. And, and by the way, my wife is not going with us, so it's just me and my son, and so. My son and I, we drove, and then like the rain stops, and then like literally right when we pull into the zoo, and my son, so he's uh, he was three at the time. He's like, "Daddy, is that rain?" I'm like, um, "Yes." And so um, I had no umbrella, I had no raincoats, I had none of that. And so we uh, go out and we go to the zoo, and there's this. Thank God, there's a little shop over the place, so we get these umbrellas. I get him an umbrella, and I got me, I got me an umbrella. So I'm like, we can make this fun. It's like this. You were going on a real safari, you know. We're not doing like a fake safari. We're going on a real one. And so we get our umbrellas, and so we get into the zoo, and I, I realize that my son's never really dealt with an umbrella before. And so, um, you know, you're really supposed to like lean in the umbrella into the rain if it rains, and then so he's like not doing any of that. Like it's like not fully open, and then it's kind of coming through the middle, and he's getting wet. And then, like, and then, and then, finally, I have to show him how to, you know, open up the umbrella. And then he goes around and sees the biggest puddle, jumps in the puddle, water gets all over him. He's like, "Daddy, I'm wet." <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. So what I have to realize is that his application of the covering that he had was off. And the same thing is when you assess your armor, maybe the application of the covering that you have may be off. Same thing that we all learn in our seminary classes, what real theology is and how God works. And that's different than when it hits you in actual reality. You have to learn this the hard way is that you're, you say this in our classes, right? Your orthodoxy has to match your orthopraxy, right? But when that really happens, you have to assess your armor to realize that what is God really protecting me from? He didn't promise to protect us from physical things on this earth. A good example of that is Jesus. He didn't promise to protect us from temporal things, but he did promise to protect us in an eternity. So when we assess our armor, we'll be able to see what God is truly protecting us from. We'll be able to readjust what the armor is really for. We have to reassess our armor. The next thing is to remain righteous. There's moments when our barriers, our walls, our armor may seem as if it is being crumbled. And in those moments, it may be very tempting to go into things that may be like temporary armor. So what happens is you see this all the time is that people will go in and do things that make them feel good in the moment, but don't actually give them eternal hope. So what we have to do is remain righteous because that is a part of the covering. That's the breastplate of righteousness that God gives us, right? That's the part that we put on and we can take off. And so when we put on and take off, that's the problem. Is if we take that off, God, that, protecting, that protection that God has given us is there at risk. So we need to be careful of that. And the last thing is to weaponize the word. When the enemy comes in, his goal is to make you, again, doubt God's goodness. He's done this in multiple ways. He did this in the garden with Adam and Eve. He takes something good to make you doubt God's goodness. They wanted to be like God, good thing. Then he made you doubt that so that they... Twist that around to where they doubt God's goodness. Oh, God doesn't want you to be just like him. He did the same thing across scripture. You look through Job. 
Job had a blessing from God. That was a good thing. Family, his livestock, all these good things that were from God. But God, he flipped it on him. So take that away so that see if you actually curse God in the other, other direction. He did the same thing with David. David had status and position. Those are a good thing to use for his influence. The devil twisted that so he used that to get Bathsheba, who he wanted, and then kill her husband off. Did the same thing with Moses. The good thing that Moses had was moving towards and freeing his, his people. But then when he saw that, the devil used that to kill one of the Egyptian soldiers, and then put them off into exile. See, God is trying to use what you think is a good thing. In my case, it was my family. Trying to use what I thought was good, twist it in a way to where I doubt God's goodness. So what you have to do is do what Jesus did. Is you have to weaponize the word. You see, the realize is the, the, the weapon that is talked about in the armor of God is our sword. And how we weaponize the word is we have to look through scripture in a way that allows us to attack the devil when he comes at us in a way that makes us doubt God's goodness. What Jesus does is three times in Matthew 4. And in, in, in the end of it, what he does is at the very end of the time, Jesus is brought up to the mountain and he brought, brings up to the mountain and he shows Jesus a good thing, him ruling over, which is eventually what he's going to have. But the difference between all those other individuals and Jesus is that he uses the word as a weapon. He's able to come back at the devil to show him, hey, what you have tried to show me is the doubt God's goodness is I'm showing you back what God has already given me. That's what we need to do. Our temptation for each and every one of us is to read a book of the Bible. Oh, look, I read Ephesians in one day. <laughs> but did you really weaponize parts of the word? I learned this the hard way. I was reading scripture and I was reading through books and I was reading through all this knowledge and I was gaining it and I was feeling good. I was like, I, I could tell you about all the ologies, right? Eschatology, soteriology, hermartiology, anthropology. I could tell you all about that stuff. I was so excited to just throw my knowledge out there. But where was the weapon? What we need to do as people that are in the word is our temptation is that our knowledge is going to fuel the weapon. But that's not what the Bible asks us to do. What we need to do is ponder on one scripture. See that in the context of it. So when the devil comes at you, you can throw that right back at him and say, that's not true. We need to see that God is giving us this armor. And this armor is our choice to put this armor on to be able to fight what the devil's schemes are so his mafia won't come against us. I close with this. So Anne, y'all remember Anne? So Anne... Um, so at the very end of that, right, she was hit, she was crying, and she, bam, hit again. But what um, Russell didn't realize is that when you hit somebody in the head, someone else gets to come back in. Y'all remember that game? Yeah. So if you hit somebody in the head, someone else comes back in. And then he also had a rule that after the game is over, if you continue to throw the ball, then the PE teacher comes in the game. <laughs> so Ann is in the game. And then our PE teacher, so at that time he was probably like 33, which we thought was ancient, right? <laughs> and he comes into the game and he's really fit and he comes in and so now it's Russell against his 33 year old, right? And Russell has no more balls. Because he just threw them all. So all the balls are on the other side. PE teacher comes into the game, Ann's over there crying. PE teacher gets the balls, he's like, and so remember Russell's not the best kid, right? So <laughs> P teacher's probably got a lot of pent up <laughs> aggression. And so P teacher is like, you know, gets his balls and he's ready. And then Russell's trying to dodge. And so um, I don't know what this is about accuracy or something, but he gets all three of those balls of Russell. Boom, 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 boom. Russell's out, done. It's team one wins. The beauty about the story, and if you see the armor of God, is that we're always in the defensive stance. And the reason why we're always in the defensive stance is because we've already won. What, the, what God provides us and provides us to be able to move forward is that at the end of the story, he's the one that has all the balls. He's the one that although we've been hit and we've been pummeled and we've been started crying and we wanted to give up, if we fortify our faith, he'll come in at the end and say, look, I told you, if you just waited, I was the one that was going to win in the first place. That is our encouragement. That is our word. That is our weapon. So when we feel like we've been hit and we want to go into these parts of, 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 our, of our ministry and we want to give up our witness, and we want to give up what God has given us, God is saying, continue forward because I've already won. I'm going to get the glory regardless of what you do. I want you to be on the side of the winning team. So that's my charge to you. 
is God's glory is supposed to rain out through each and every one of you, in your ministries, in your life, in your house, in your places, that the enemy and his mafia can only do a temporary damage. At the end of the day, we know we serve a father and our Lord Jesus, Savior Christ has already won that we can trust in. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the armor that you've given us. You've given us salvation. You've given us the gospel, which is good news. You've given us the helmet of salvation. You've given us all of these things, Father. And we thank you for giving us these things despite of who we are. Help us to be reminded of the battle that you've already won. So when we go into our own personal battles, wherever somebody is here today, if they're struggling with something and they're wondering how they can make it through and they're wondering how um, they can continue to serve you, Father, I pray that they will be encouraged today. They'll be encouraged because you've been with them, you continue to be with them, and that you've won the battle at the end of the age. You've already won the battle now. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.